Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the program. I'm Christiane Amanpour. This time yesterday, I was talking to you about that potential Al-Qaeda terrorist attack, that bomb-making cell that was infiltrated. But today, we're focusing on the vast majority of young Muslims around the Arab world who have rejected Al-Qaeda's ideology. They've brought down their leaders with peaceful protest, and they are now on the brink of democracy. Just two weeks from now, Egyptians will do something that they've never done before, and that is vote in a real democratic election with real choices for president. There's been triumph and violence, chaos and hope on the road to this moment. And in my brief tonight, what kind of Egypt will we see emerge? What will the role of Islam be? The world has been watching, and what we've seen so far is often troubling. Those impressive and massive demonstrations of the uprising a year ago have descended in recent days into violent clashes between Islamists and the military. But still, optimism rules right now. According to the latest Pew poll, a majority of Egyptians hope for a democratic outcome. For the first time in Egypt, no one knows who will be their next president. But right now, these men are the top candidates. Amr Musa is the secular former Egyptian foreign minister who once led the Arab League. Abdel Monim Abu Futu left the Muslim Brotherhood in order to run for president. He's considered moderate and has the support of many liberals, but also the ultra-conservative ultra -conservative Salafists. We hope to be speaking to them in the coming days. But the third candidate is my guest tonight. He is Mohamed Morsi, the American educated engineer who's head of the Freedom and Justice Party. That's the political wing of the Muslim Brotherhood, Egypt's most powerful political movement, and right now controls half of parliament. The big questions for Egypt and a watching world is how Islamic will the new democracy be? I sat down to talk about all of this with Mohamed Morsi in a conversation that moved between English and Arabic. <laughs> Professor Morsi, thank you for joining us. Shukran Thank you very much. Welcome to you. The Muslim Brotherhood said that it was not going to be running for the presidency as a confidence-building measure for the rest of Egypt, the rest of the world watching. What changed? Why did you decide to go uh, from not running and not competing to competing? The, the situation in general, the domestic situation and the international situation and our neighbor situation, the people have accepted our uh, majority in the parliament and we haven't been able to do whatever we want through the parliament because the government is not in our hands and the presidential campaign will enable the Egyptians if they choose us to pass through this bottleneck and have a better situation in the future. We feel that this is a responsibility on our shoulders and we should carry it up with the Egyptians. The Muslim Brotherhood slogan was Islam is the solution and then that sort of went to the side as you all focused on other issues that matter to the Egyptian people. The slogan has come back again, and there are people who are concerned that a Muslim Brotherhood, which wins the presidency and dominates the parliament, could introduce a fundamentalist theocracy, an Islamic theocracy. What do you say to that? Uh, the Egyptian people are freely making their choice now, and they are the ones who chose the parliament. We are talking about elections and democracy. If the Egyptian people have chosen their leaders, then there won't be any room for worry. We want to transform from a president of the institution to an institution of the presidency, to an executive branch that represents the people's true will and implements their public interest. If you were president, do you see Egypt as more like Turkey, an Islamic democracy, or more like Iran, which is more fundamentalist and autocratic? There is no such thing called an Islamic democracy. There is democracy only. And democracy is the instrument that is present now. The people are the source of authority. The social mindset is, there are a people and the people chooses. That's democracy. And that agrees with consultation called for in Islam. With that, we are eager for freedom. We are eager for justice social justice and a democratic constitutional state. We see Egypt as a democratic country. The Egyptian people are free and the people's will should be implemented. What about the role of women? Can a woman under a Muslim Brotherhood presidency, once the constitution is written, do you agree with a woman running for president? I see it being called the presidency of the Muslim Brotherhood, but it is the presidency of Egypt. 
The president of Egypt in the next period will be chosen and elected by Egyptians. So if they pick the head of the Freedom and Justice Party, he will represent all Egyptians. And in that case, the presidency in Egypt will be a constitutional presidency. He will follow the law in the constitution that applies to all. The role of women in Egyptian society is clear. Women's rights are equal to men. Women have complete rights just like men. There shouldn't be any kind of distinction between Egyptians except that that is based on the constitution and law. Can you guarantee to the women of Egypt that if you were to be president, that the law that currently exists that makes it a criminal offense to sexually abuse women will not be overturned, will not be struck down. Uh, Rights will be based on the Constitution. So all Egyptians, whether Muslims or Christians, men or women, everyone and all will agree to it and will themselves call for it in the Constitution. And that means there is no need for worry at all over any kind of abuse of power. It will be impossible to allow these kinds of abuse in the shadow of a constitutional state, a lawful state, a state that protects the dignity of a person. There is no room for any abuse of any kind of Egyptians or even those who reside in the land of Egypt who aren't Egyptians. So what I hear you saying is that you agree that the new constitution should keep that law, should make sure that constitutionally women are protected. Of course. All right. Well, thank you for saying that in English. I hear you loud and clear. And so will the women. Let me ask you about a different <laughs> issue. <laughs> Let, do you think that women should run for president in Egypt? Yeah, remember, remember, re remember you are a woman. I exactly. respect you. Thank you. And all the Egyptian women are hoping that they will be respected and their rights will thank be you. guaranteed. So I guess now that I have you here, I just want you to say it loud and clear. Yeah, loudly and clearly, all Egyptian women have the same rights like the men. They are all my sisters, my daughters, uh, my wife, and my mother. They are all Egyptians. There is no differences whatsoever among the people in Egypt, the people of Egypt, based on anything like belief or uh, sex or whatever you call or you name. Let me turn to foreign policy. Of course, Egypt is one of the countries, one of the few countries in your region that has a peace treaty with Israel, the Camp David Accords of 1979. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood has said that they would stand, but you've also said that you might put that to a referendum if you win the presidency. Will you guarantee that you will not put that existing treaty to a referendum? Egypt is a great country, proud and ancient, and is a member of the United Nations. Egypt, the institution, the state, in its new regime, respects all the treaties and agreements that have been implemented between it and between the states of the world. With that, we confirm that we respect all the treaties that we have signed on to before as Egyptians. At the same time, we say that what Israelis have done in terms of violations in the past must be taken into account by the new Egypt, and Egypt with a message of peace. We have come to the world with a message of peace, but we cannot permit any form of aggression upon us, whether in words or in deeds. It's now time for the Israelis to know that the peace accord must be respected by both sides, and no parties to it should violate it. As leader of the Freedom and Justice Party, you have in the past, before you became the leader of this party, called Israeli leaders vampires and killers, and you basically said that even if you're president, you won't meet with the leaders. How is that going to work if you're president and you have a peace treaty with Israel? We want balanced international relations with all states of the world. We continue to protect the accords we have made with all. At the same time, we are able as Egyptians with an elected president to protect our border and to defend ourselves. And we won't allow anyone to threaten that border. Whoever wants to live in peace and follow those treaties must show his sincerity. I just want to ask you one last question on the on the treaty with Israel, because, you know, with all the translation, I just want to make sure that I've, I've got it correctly. Let me just get it straight. Are you saying that if you were president, the treaty will stand, it will not go to a referendum, and you will respect that treaty? Yes, of course, I will.
Got it. Loud and clear. Give me another point. Yeah. The provided, I were respected, provided the other side, keep it up and respect it. Very, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Same to you. And in Israel, meanwhile, Prime Minister Netanyahu has gone into a coalition with the Kadima party, and there's talks about trying to restart talks with the Palestinians. But among the Palestinians, a growing impatience with the process has sparked a different form of resistance. Gandhi on the River Jordan, when we come back, stay with us. <laughs> 